Okay, let's uh, start our third day of seminars in a row uh, with Robert Insall, previously from Glasgow, currently at Cambridge, who will speak about uh, cancer cells and how they sort mates. You can introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. No, that, that introduction is fine. Informals. That introduction is fine. Let me see if I can see. I can't see anything that's going on online, so uh, people will have to shout. I have got have got the sound. Shout if um, if you're online and I need anything. Um, so um, I, I, can I show you the punchline first? Because why not? Um, there's some cells I'm going to point it here. Will it work? You have a pointer behind you. Yeah. And I found stuff. Yeah. No. This. Oh, maybe I've done it wrong here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do this. Oh, well, maybe I better not. I'll do that. The point for now. Uh, so there's there's some other cells affecting, and you can see in each case there's a, a, a stimulus, there's a positive gradient. Um, the cells um, inefficiently but clearly chemotax double gradient. Right. Uh, it's it's normal chemotaxis uh, that we're talking about. It. Now you mix these two gradients. And now the sound goes on. Um, and this is smashing because you see, I'm a I'm a um uh, a wet biologist um who's been hanging with mathematicians for about 15 years. Uh, and the, the position I now take is is sat right in the middle. And we knew this was going to happen because the math said it would, but most biologists don't believe it can happen, and it's 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 all rather nice. Okay. So thanks to the people first. Um, some of you here, welcome. Uh, many of you here probably know John McKenzie uh, from Strathclyde, who uh, has always helped me with all the uh, uh, mathematical parts. Luke is a physicist and Adam is uh, a math uh, PhD student from my group. McKenzie is the engineer who did all the um, uh, devices. And Andy was a uh, dermatologist who came and did all the cancer cell work. And lots of other people helped. Okay. Um, uh, and of course, uh, the reason we study it, the reason I get paid to study it, is that cancer is lethal, lethal when it's bad. Um, and the other thing that perhaps you folk all know instinctually, but most biologists don't because we look down microscopes so much. Oh, dear. Sorry. My uh, elderly father would like to help, or maybe he can't get the zoom link. Um, uh, random migration is is um, very splendid when you look at it through a microscope. You see cells move a very substantial difference when you look like under a microscope. But for anything on the scale of a body, it's completely useless, completely irrelevant. Only steered migration takes you anywhere um, because the actual distance you migrate to the, uh, scales with the square of time. Uh, uh, random migration would mean diffusion. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I would call it random migration. You might call it diffusive yeah. migration. It's not un unsteered migration. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter whether a levee flight doesn't take you anywhere either on the scale of a body. Um, uh, uh, but a very small amount of steering will take you anywhere you like over over uh, organismal time. So movement is not interesting. Steering is interesting in the context of, of that. Um, and then the whole thing that I want to do in uh, the, this meeting, and I've been talking with some uh, people who are here already, um, is uh, I actually want to start expressing all the things I'm talking about here in information theory terms, um, because everything that I'm just talking about is always expressible in information theory terms, but we always use semantics instead. And in my converted version of me that has been spending too much time with mathematicians and physicists, it drives me around the bend because semantic explanations are useless. So you want to be able to explain them theoretically. Um, uh, so the thing we actually want to explain is how uh, something like that turns into something like that. Yeah, it is good, yes. Do you know whose who's child that is? 
And I'm far too good to show someone's child on there. It's a, <laughs> it's an AL generated one. I can I can generate the child. Uh, um, so during this process of going from the, the egg is real, um, going from the egg to the, the, the you need lots of increase in complexity, obviously. You need lots of information on information, obviously, lots of increase. Uh, the thing that is maybe less obvious, although now I've said it, it will perhaps be obvious, is you need lots of human hexes because as the egg forms, all you get is fairly uh, uh, symmetrical layers, sheets of cells, and what you need is cells to move around. Um, germ cells uh, uh, move from the guts to the, to the gonad. Um, neural crest moves all around. Um, uh, human hexes is most important. Um, the one thing you will not ever see any of us saying is the cells can text along a pre-existing gradient, because imagining that there are pre-existing gradients in that is stupid. So the cells don't make the gradients. Well, one thing I don't understand is what is hemotaxis. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, that's I'm I'm very glad you asked. Hemotaxis is um one of a family of ways of steering cells. Um, it's chemotaxis if they're being steered by a gradient of something diffusible. Okay. Um, and if they're being stirred by electricity, it's galvanotaxis and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thank you for asking that. Yeah. So there's um, Bob May, the redoubtable both mathematician and, and um, biologist, um, saying if your animal doesn't organize itself, then who the is going to organize it for you? Right? Uh, we have to find out where the information comes from. And the information is going to be created by emergent interactions within the embryo itself, or they're not going to. Uh, there you are. So I did define it. It's just one slide too late for you. Sorry. This is the slide from 1952, I think, showing human taxes. This is a neutrophil chasing a bacterium. Um, it is almost beyond belief that it was possible to take this movie in 1950 something. Um, each of these images, each frame is a black and white picture on a black and white film. Um, and it's still the best, the most. Uh, 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 um, emotionally involving image of hemotaxis. You see, that's a, a, a human use cell. It's human blood. Those are the red blood cells. That's a bacterium, which is surely going to kill a human if it's not hunted down and killed. Um, and um, you can almost hear the bacterium squeaking <laughs> as the neutrophil chases and, and, and kills it. Mom. Um, uh, more. Uh, uh, relevantly to all of this, if you have a melanoma, um, you are at very great risk. Doctors do not see patients with big melanomas. Uh, with a breast tumor, you can have tumors the size of a grapefruit, especially in places where, where uh, cancer care is not good. There are no melanomas the size of a grapefruit because the patient was dead years ago. If you have a melanoma, it will spread. There's really very little debate about it. It gets to a certain size and then it spreads. And they spread by chemotaxis. You can see that they spread by chemotaxis because if these guys were moving randomly, diffusing, et cetera, they would be calcium. But they're not calcium. They're in fact, sometimes overtly wrenching. Um, so they are spreading because they are uh, uh, migrating in, in something, uh, towards something. And here's a lovely uh, uh, demonstration of it. These are chambers that I design and have made. Um, you've got a well with low chemotransit there, and you've got a well with high chemotransit here, and you've got a bridge between them. It's a development of a zygmunt chamber for anyone who's used them, or a gun chamber, if you prefer. And um, what the cells do is really stunning. I mean, they're amazingly good at moving from the low uh, attracted to the high from the It's just serum in this case. It's just uh, 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 what happens if you take blood and let it clot. Um, you see a couple of things here that are interesting. You see that it's not um, uh, uh, homogeneous, that they're, they're moving in a wave. They're very, very fast. So you want to actually be really quite scared looking at this because this distance from here to here is about the distance from the center of a tumor to a, 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 the, um, endothelial, the endothelium. So what you are seeing here will kill you if you have a melanoma. This is the cells moving from the melanoma into your bloodstream. When I 
had this picture taken in my lab. I went straight to the doctor and said, I've got these black spots. Could you please? Um, okay, so the question we want to ask is where did the information come from? Rephrase it. Um, why does your body make a gradient in order for the melanoma to kill you? And of course, your body doesn't make a gradient for the melanoma to kill you. The melanoma makes the gradient for the melanoma to kill you. And the best way of showing that is to do exactly the same experiment that we did before. Exactly, except instead of having serum here, no serum there, and making the cells chemotaxed to the serum, we put serum on both sides. And what happens, it's exactly the same as if you did a normal chemotaxis experiment, thereby proving A, um, uh, uh, never do controls uh, to any biologists who are here. B, if you think about things, we, we understood this as soon as it was happened because we had been thinking about these sorts of things and thinking mathematically. What is really happening when melanoma cells hematax to serum is that the melanoma cells are breaking down the attractants from the serum and are fabricating their own gradient locally. The gradient is formed by an interaction between the cells breaking down the attractant, the cells migrating, um, and the attractants diffusing through the liquid across the cap. And you have a gradient from there to there from saturating chemoattractants to zero chemoattractants, uh, which is uh, uh, remarkable. And that's why they chemotax so well. And in the slide I showed you before, although we fed them a gradient, they're not reading the gradient. They're taking the gradient we fed them and breaking down lots of the contents of it and making a different gradient. And you can measure them not making any of the attractants, which in this case is LPA, but it doesn't matter. And then if you have a low density of cells, they break down the LPA if you feed them serum. And if you have a high density of cells, they break it down faster. So you're reasonably happy that the cells are doing what we think they are. Uh, and we call this self-generated gradients. And actually, the funny thing is, um, I realize this more and more every year, People totally knew about self-generating gradients for decades, but for want of a name and for want of sticking an equation on it, they just brushed it under the carpet. Um, and the only thing that's changed is that we noticed that all the experiments we were doing were in fact responding to gradients that the cells were making out of what we'd fed them. Um, and so it changed our, our way of seeing things. So nearly every chemotactic gradient you ever see a cell moving to is always shaped by the cell itself. It's really cool. Um, and remember that the question is always going to be where the information. Um, so what we do is we do experiments. We're good at that. Um, we make finite element models to try and describe the experiments. We've now started actually um, uh, uh, putting them on GitHub and giving them front ends so more people can use them. And when possible, we do analytical math. And when I say we, that's not me, I'm a wet biologist, um, but um, something like a third of my lab are now um, math and theoretical physics people. Um, and uh, we have lots of fun. One of the really um, uh, nice things that this audience would like is that wave of cells moving across a boundary between saturating attractant and zero attractant um, is actually perfectly described by Stefan equations, for example, melting ice, except that the term one term um, reversed, because it is a boundary between something with lots of energy and not uh, with uh, a material diffusion between the two. That's that. Um, so if you have this sort of system, you get the complexity. And you get uh, uh, also the simplicity because the uh, models and the analytical math can actually have relatively few terms in order to get quite a lot of biological spatiotemporal complexity. And everything is interpretable and uh, well explained. Uh, and it's rather nice because the mathematicians do well out of it because the math needs expanding. The biologists do well out of it because by having um, mathematicians um, uh, explain things, we get a better idea, a much more complete idea of what's going on, and we all, everyone's a better friend. Um, one thing we never use is linear pathway. Biologists, that's for biologists, and I think none of you are. Well, uh, biologists love saying A goes to B goes to C goes to B, 
And we just say, all you're doing is kicking the football up the field. You discover nothing from the middle. And it's a mathematical biology it's paradise. It's totally driven by feedback loops. Um, it's full of amusing abilities. I'll show you one later. Um, you cannot try and use insights to solve it. You have to use equations and models. And the biggest trouble we have since we've been working in this field is that referees in mainstream journals keep telling us using their insight that we're wrong. And we show them the equations and they write back saying, no, my insight says you're wrong. Um, and thank goodness we are winning the argument. But even in that, that last big paper we wrote on this science paper about three or four years ago, even in the last round of referee, one of the referees said, Dr. Insel is wrong and I am certain of it. That was fun. That was really good. Um, so it, it's it's an, an interesting world, but it, it, it does mean that the mathematicians and the biologists must be talking to one another to do it. And it's full of emergent properties, including that slide I showed you. So there is a nice, simple agent-based model showing what it looks like when this happens. The red thing is the attractant. Yeah, it's not on my screen. Let's see if it goes. Yeah, okay. Um, Go back up for a minute. Yeah, no, I don't know. No, really, it went. <laughs> it's an emergent property. <laughs> Quite out of sync. I've never seen this one before. Oh, well. What is the red thing? The red is the diffusible attractant. So the cells are breaking down ah. the attractant with an enzyme. So they mean they the That's right. The attractant diffuses with a, a, a biologically measured diffusion coefficient from where it is. It's stopped again. It's not stopped here. Oh, yeah. um, Sorry, is that the cells released down that? Part? The cells have in this. Model the cells have an enzyme on that surface that breaks down the attractant. Um, we have simulated what happens if the cells actually release an enzyme, and the answer is it looks pretty much the same, it's just a little bit um, earlier. That was um, uh, a good and helpful referee who we had a very nice time. Um, uh, so uh, you have um, a bunch of things that vary a lot depending on which cells we look at. So we tend to look at cells that move quite rapidly. Melanoma cells move very rapidly. That's part of why so uh, uh, we like amoebas and we like uh, neutrophils. If you looked at fibroblasts, um, it, would, it would be a completely different world. Same uh, system of equations, but it looks it looks different. Um, so one of the things that's interesting here is we use masses of attractants. So um, uh, what the red is showing is an absolutely saturating attractant, uh, and the cells could not possibly read a gradient like that, mm -hmm. because if you're a cell sat in it, you're saturated on upstream, and you're saturated downstream, there's no the attractant by the X, you've, you've, you've got nothing to read. And then you go and look through the literature, and you find out that about 60% of all the published literature uses gradients that should not be possible to be read, because they've put too much stuff in. And about 40% does. So it seems that uh, it starts out as a curving way. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yes, yes. 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 That's interesting. Isn't it? Um, so all of the migration that is happening in this simulation, I mean, if uh, I don't think I had time to show a real one, but the real looks exactly the same as the simulation. Mm, yeah. um, all of the migration is being driven by chemotaxis. But in this one, we haven't pinned the concentration of attractant at the end. We've got a fixed amount in. So the wave needs fewer and fewer and fewer cells as it comes across. So constantly, you can actually just about see it happening. The cell at the back sees no signal. Yeah, yeah. No, but, but, but I, I, I also meant that the. Uh, yeah, no, it, that, 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 that process of dropping off cells. The, it's the, the wave current starts. It, it seems as if it was the curvature. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I might be. I think it's probably an uh, um, accident. It's it's very, very robust. So it tends to self-correct. I will show an example that is self, uh, that is unstable um, and doesn't correct. I'll show a version that's unstable. Okay. And so you get a fingering instability okay. out of it. 
So all the information is coming from the cell. Um, although these cells have come out here, they wouldn't have come out there if they weren't here. Okay? So during the simulation, by the time you see them, these cells are not chemotaxic, they're moving randomly. But the reason they're not there is chemotaxis. Again, biologists that, uh, find this really uh, uh, hard to um, consider. And you ask, why does melanoma like it? Well, this, this experiment is absolutely staggering. It is unbelievable that we managed to do this experiment. So this is a mass embryo. And we have labeled the melanoblasts, the precursors of the melanocytes that give you pigment and the things that give you melanoma in the end. We've labeled them with GFP. So you can see in the limb um, the melanoblasts. Now, when you're an embryo, you're white. You can see this, there's no pigment in the embryo. And what happens is your melanoblasts emerge from the neural crest. They migrate from the neural crest, which is either side of your backbone, round through the dermis. And they go all the way around the tummy, they go all the way down the arms. And if you have uh, inefficient migration, you end up with a white spot on your tummy, white spot in the middle of your forehead, and white hands. And actually, there are people walking around who have that. Um, and we had some mice uh, that had that. My uh, my wife is a is a big shot biochemist and helped fed me with these. And um, uh, she had a bunch of mutations with white spots in their belly. We started getting un unreasonably excited when we saw a mouse with a white tummy. Um, anyhow, uh, this experiment here, we are looking at it. We've taken the embryo out and we're looking at it live. And what you see is that the cells, the uh, proximal and the distal end of the arm, are migrating in a directed way. And the ones that are 300 microns behind are migrating out. Um, so we think we know what the chemo attractant is, and we can model the entire process of getting pigmented um, uh, by um, uh, combining actually two, I'll talk about this some other time, I don't want to make it, um, by combining two self-generating things. Um, but it really is really is happening in the real time. So we're talking too slowly. Okay, why would uh, this is much more uh, uh, directly aimed at the team out here. Why would you want to use self-generated gradients? Well, so imagine that you use an imposed gradient. These cells are just reading the gradient, and it's started from here, and it's diffused into a linear gradient. And the signal-to-noise ratio is pretty high at the beginning, and then it gets lower and lower as the cells get further on the gradient. The signal-to-noise gets lower and lower for two reasons. One is just basic counting, but as your receptors, um, and as you go from zero at your back end to something at your front end, the ratio between the number of occupied receptors at the front and back gets less favorable. And then you have the other thing, uh, which is that the receptors start to saturate. And the more your receptors saturate, the less information you have. So imposed gradients are very good at the low end, and they get less and less good. The self-generated gradient, the low end is always at the back of the cell. And the gradient is always made by the cells and it's always self-focused, so they go on forever. Um, what that means is that if you are uh, giving cells a gradient and they're just reading it, it turns out that there's a totally physically limited distance that cells can read. So if you give them a low concentration, then you get a very, very flat gradient when it spreads out. What we've done here is we're trying to simulate a five millimeter gradient. Red is not legible and green is legible. So if you put cells here and then give them a low concentration of a cactus there, you get a legible gradient, but by the time it's diffused across where the cells are, it's illegible. If you give them a high concentration, it diffuses across to show them a legible gradient, but then the moment they try and move, they become saturated. And there is absolutely no way of getting around this. You cannot create a circumstance where cells can chemotax over five millimeters um, without using many different receptors, many different uh, uh, sensitivities. But a cell-generated gradient carries its legibility around with it. And if it ever goes wrong and you get swamped by an attractant, then the cells just sit still. And when they sit still, they break down more and more attractant until the attractant does become legible. So you get a robust system 
where if you get the concentrations wrong, you see a delay. So the question that medics always ask me in um, uh, uh, when they see the melanomas is, could we not stop this process by giving people drugs? And the answer is no. If you gave them drugs, um, what you would actually probably do is make the disease spread faster because we can't drug 100% of the response away. We can only drug 90% of the response away. And there's plenty of chemotaxis that are very, very sensitive. And if you stop the cells breaking down um, the attractant, then you just get a delay and then they break down enough. And if you stop cells perceiving the attractant, then the delay is shot. So um, uh, we probably can't help that. So what this all means is that if you ever see a gradient that's operating above one millimeter absolutely peak with a very diffusible um, attractant, probably much less than that, then the cells must be generating some of the information from the data. It doesn't work the other way around. If you see a shock gradient, the cells could be self-generated or it could be um, inferred. Okay, let's look at another nice question. So if you have a bunch of simulated cells uh, in a forked path, half of them go either way. But if you connected one end of the forked path to a new source, um, then um, actually what happens is they start off 50 50, 50 and then more often go to the pinned one because it's got a, a greater source of attraction. It's obvious. Right. If you make the unpinned branch shorter, then you start seeing something interesting happen because nearly all of the cells go the other way because the group of cells that are coming up has broken down enough of the attractant in the short branch that by the time they arrive, there's enough information to make a decision. Yeah, the blue represents a source. Okay. So that's pinned to the outside yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what that means is that you can take it to its extreme, and you can make a maze, and the cells will go in this maze, and every time they have to make a decision, they have broken down enough of the attractant that they can tell the difference between the self that's connected to the pin and the self that's not. Uh, we may have a full cry. Yeah. It worked out. Uh, never happened before, but Apple did make an emergency um, update because they had an exploit uh, last night. So it may be. Right, I'm just going to do this a different way and then we won't have this problem anymore. Sorry about this, people. Uh, zoom. Share screen. Oh. oh, not working beautifully. Oh, okay. okay. Never mind. Um, you can see it all working. Now, um, I do a tease when I'm showing this to, to, to um, biologists. It isn't so much fun with you guys. Um, it's actually less fun with biologists now because when I started doing this work and simulating these sorts of things, biologists had still not really bought the idea that you could learn anything from simulations. They were still saying, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can show me these things all day, but I'm just going to go and do an experiment. And, uh, so I always was asking people for a show of hands about how many people would believe an experiment if I, uh, uh, if it was simulated. And of course, the whole thing about this is that because we have equations, and our equations are now right. It's a, a weird thing 
Um, I guess um, for, for ecologists, it's not so surprising because ecologists have got the equations to describe the populations pretty accurately. Cell biologists don't do that. We don't have math that is good enough to give you reality. But these experiments, the parameters are right, the distances are right. If the um, simulations say something is going to happen, broadly speaking, it, it happens. And if they don't, it's because we've learned some biology. So one of the things you can see here is there is one difference between this and the uh, model, which is that instead of just having a wave, there's cells behind them too. And the model predicted that would not happen. And it turns out that the drug we've given these cells, these addictive stealing cells in this case, and the drug that we gave them to stop them talking to one another works in the bulk, but in the tiny volumes you get in microfluidics, it doesn't work anymore. Um, it's mostly working, um, but they're still able to talk to one another. Some, and if we go and knock out the genes that let them talk to one another, then it fits the model perfectly. And we're in that stage, which as far as I know has only happened in the kind of cell biology uh, domain once at other times, which is here in Cambridge, which is Dennis Bray with bacterial hemophysis, when there was a disagreement between Dennis Bray's models and the experiments. It was because there was something unknown in the, in the science. And we've, we've hit that now. We've discovered a few unknown things from doing all of this. Is great. So this is uh, cute, but it's also really, really, really important. That's what is happening when cells spread. And we think it's happening on lots of different cancers. Um, uh, glioblastoma, for example, is fairly obviously spreading by hemotaxis. And it's fairly obvious that the gradients are always where the front of the glioblast um, This is what happens when you get an infection. The immune cells are, are homing because of that. In embryonic development, um, I flag germ cells because I know some of you know about them. The germ cells are made in the guts. During early embryogenesis, they migrate from the guts through the middle of the body to the gonads. If you don't do that, then you don't have any babies. No germ cells. Uh, um, and um, the uh, uh, middle of an embryo is just like those mazes I showed you. And the problem is just the same. You have a limited amount of information and you have to find the best way to get that. And nerves uh, finding one another in brain development and so on and so on and so forth. Whenever we have a biological question to do with moving cells, it, it, it's still uh, here. And it's universal. But there are some macrophages. This is macrophages migrating to no human attractant and you might track them everywhere. So this is incredible. There's no positional information in the gradient here, except what the macrophages themselves have made. And they're so directed. And there's by far the most directed population of macrophages anyone's ever managed to get a video of. Because we have a different idea about where the information comes from. And there are some T cells, oh, sorry, dendritic cells, probably a maze. That's another of our mazes, and that's what happens in your in your lymph nodes. The dendritic cells um, have to solve something very much akin to a maze to find the T cells, and that's how you have immunity. And Robert, could you do something basically to prevent the cells to break up the black so that this movement, this this so gradient, does not in the experiments, break? yes, totally. Uh, one of the things we do is we have chemoattractants which are chemically changed. So that the cells can't break them down. So they won't move. They don't tell anybody. No, they're completely, completely stuck. And when you give them a gradient increase, they sort of just about read it, but not very well. Mm -hmm. And in the old literature, they were called bad chemoattractants. But they're perfect chemoattractants. It's just that the cells need to break them down to, to read them. We can take away the enzymes. That, when you know what the thing is that's being followed, you can take away the enzymes. The trouble is, Better to be a mathematician. It takes like two or three person years to take the enzymes out of the dendritic cell to break down this. Whereas in a simulation, you just open up your Python and you reverse one, one per hour. But we're doing this now. There's some glioblastomas. That's why we're frightened of glioblastoma. This is just a lump of glioblastomas. We've dubbed them on a glass color strip in rich medium. And they move normal to the edge of the lump. And the secret is if you have a pump and you start removing liquid from here and put it here, you don't put any forces on the cells, but you do ruin diffusion, 
than what you see with this. Come on. So the gear blast only cells are migrating because of a diffusion limited attractive chemical. And when that's taken away, they prefer to stick to one another. So the, the steering signal dominates. And then if you haven't got the steering signal, you get an adhesion signal. Hey, Carl, I Julius Adler, some of you may have come upon him. A wonderful painting. You see this? A piece design was born. Nearly everyone who I interact with and uh, supervise wasn't. I was um, nine months old. And, and I gave this uh, uh, in a talk a while ago, and someone in the audience said, you know, Julius Adler is still uh, working in Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know if he's still working there now. He's still alive, but um, this was just before lockdown. He still had a lab, and he still had postdocs and so forth. But he showed that if you have agar, which only has one sugar in it, and you stop bacteria and metal, if you are in a ring, inside that ring, there is zero galactose, and outside that ring is saturating galactose, and it's a, it's a phase field. And if you do it on normal rich agar, you get three rings. And if he showed that the outer ring is serine, so it's more serine than zero serine. And then when they've moved all of that, you get a, a less desirable uh, sugar, which is actually it's amino acid aspartate, when you get three in the inside too. Uh, and so he knew all of this in 1966, but just uh, uh, said some words and, and carried on. So the best attractant gradients come from the self themselves. But remember, and you guys shouldn't have any problems with this, biologists always if you don't remind every every five minutes, uh, we, we, we forget that it's the gradients. It's the D attractant by the X, not the attractant itself. You can't read uh, an attractant. You can only read a gradient of the And it turns out that this is, I mean, it's more and more general. It's amazing. This, do anyone recognize that? Amazing. It's, it's King Henry the X maze in, in Hampton Court. People pay a lot of money to spend their whole afternoon getting lost. <laughs> And the cells have no trouble at all. That's kind of funny. Um, did he tell me? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, no, um, the, the, there's a leading group, and the leading group are all interchangeable. And anyone who isn't in the leading group is lost and will never ever get out because all the attractants was being broken down. But you see this interesting thing. That there's a, a glitch in the in the maze there, and the the, the cells that they're not following the maze, they're probing the environment, uh, and so when it repeats, you'll see when they come to that glitch, they know the glitch is there. So you can think about this as IKEA, and you can think about uh, the glitch as a little door that lets you go through and miss the surface section, and thereby save four hours of your life and uh, pain. Um, and the cells could tell that that bitch was there. The cells can tell that you can get out. We thought this was amazing. So we built a, a, a sort of official back door there. So we built this maze now. This is actually really sad. It's quite anthropomorphic and it's quite upsetting. So the cells go through the maze. Group of cells will take the shortcut. And the group of cells that take the shortcut consume all the attractants. So the ones that didn't take the shortcut are stuck. They will never escape. They will die in that, mm. which you often feel if you do IKEA. They really, you see that the, it's run out. They can, they can move a bit randomly, but as I say, random migration is no use. You can't get anywhere by random migration over the sort of scale of anything happening. And the diffusivity of the attractant suddenly makes a huge difference. So you have different domains, and the domain mark two. You quite often see in some of our mazes cells going the wrong way. And I'll explain that in a moment. If the attractant is very, very diffusible, then it can always be read perfectly. Uh, if the attractant is very, very non diffusible, then you can't drain one half of the diffusion. So everything is always a 50 50 chance. But if you take an easy and a hard maze, um, I'm going to look at the faces of you and see if any of you can tell which is the easy and the uh, well, again, we had the models, so we played with the models until we could get it. I'll tell you, the one on the, uh, on, on the left you know, is, is easy. 
one well, that's easy because every time you have a decision, it's a decision between a long branch and a short branch, mm -hmm. and you can easily drain the short branch before. And, and the one on the right, although people would find this one much easier, cells find it much harder because each branch, and there's a particularly fiendish thing here, which is that this decision, the distance to the next um, complex place is short, so the flux is faster here. And in this one, it's a longer distance between the decision point here and the, 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 the major source. Where are the exits? Uh, somewhere at the top. Oh. Nobody gets out. We only kill them afterwards. Is there any uh, communication between the um, There is communication by breaking down attractants because the attractant is diffusible. Mm -hmm. There's no other communication, but it turns out that breaking down attractants is a really good way of cells. Uh, you can do exactly the same by producing an attractant. There's no sort of uh, uh, theoretical difference. So there's the cell. You see in the, this one, every time I have one of these decisions, half of them go the wrong way. The first one of the places we could half go the wrong way, in fact, slightly more there. Uh, and that's what reality does. This, yes, is cyclic energy. But I showed you the dendritic cells uh, responding to CCL19 oh, yeah. earlier. Um, and it's it's deliciously general. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I am now moving, I'm going to keep working on Victor's telium. If I had stayed in Glasgow, um, Victor's telium is becoming very, very small. But in University College London, there are lots of people between this. Victor's telium is actually um, as an organism to work on is now being supported by the maths community better than the biomedical community, which is wonderful. Um, I just wanted to show one thing because you'll love this. And this is what I want to understand in the course of this meeting. Um, there is another completely different self-generated gradient was published last week. And we have found it as well in our own research. And the problem goes like this. If you're a neutrophil, you have to respond to about 200 different things. And you can't respond to 200 different things in the way that we understand you do, because every time you respond to something, you must have 10,000 receptors on your surface. If you don't have 10,000 receptors, you can't possibly tell the difference between a partial occupancy at the front and a partial occupancy at the rear. You just don't have enough information. And if you have 200 attractions, that means you need 10,000 receptors for 200 different things, and it's going to be awful and expensive. And also, you have this terrible trouble with signal to noise because all of those receptors have passed on shot noise, and all of those receptors may become activated accidentally. And each time that happens, it spoils your measurement. So we've wondered about this for ages and ages and ages. And then, how do you integrate them all? So this paper comes out, um, I have this place. Yes, this paper comes out um, last week, saying that they work the same way as Dick Kirsty, the Keller Siegel Goldberg process going on here. So what they are doing here is they're looking, the color shows whether the cells are signaling or not. Um, they're looking at the yeast, which is not diffusible. So in your traditional explanation of cells moving, the cells right next door would have responded and no one else could, but you can see a wave coming out exactly the same way as they come in at the seagull, the Gustelia, the satellite. Um, and all of these cells are chemotaxing in the direction of the yeast, but they are not chemotaxing to the yeast. The yeast is not diffusible. The chemotaxing to an attractant they have released themselves in response to the yeast, or they're chemotaxing to the attractant that's re released in response to the chemo attractant. It's a flock of animals. This is your, your world happening in, 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 in blood. Um, and I think probably what happens is that this underpins about 90% of the chemotaxis that neutrophils do. And that what happens is that. Um, 90% of the things that steer attractants, steer attractants by biasing this, this process is very easy to bias. And what I hope to do in this meeting is express that in information theory and uh, quantitative. But isn't that, isn't that magnificent in white blood cell? 
We think it happens in macrophages too. Um, something similar happens with dendritic cells too. So this is not in the universe. So both things are experiments or? This is all just an experiment, yes. These guys, uh, and, and the um, conclusions they make in this paper are, I think, spurious because they're, they're doing, they're, they're, I am a biologist, so I can slag off biologists. Um, they are uh, 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 using words to express what they're finding here. So they are assuming this gradient, that there is a, not the gradient produced by the cell, but the gradient in the first frame or something? Uh, no, they, they, have, they have understood that bit. Oh. That's one. Uh, the paper, the, the headline of the paper is about what stops this going on forever. And it seems to me obvious that this will stop if you have one parameter regime. And if you have another parameter regime, it will keep going. And it's 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 not not terribly interesting. Whereas what's amazing is this thing that was the mainstream, which is that all these cells are instructed by the yeast, but the actual agent that is moving them is made by the cells themselves. And it's the same as flocks of birds. Flocks of birds. Mostly change because they're looking at the other birds nearby, right? Yeah. Are you going to speak about this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some people are going to speak about collective okay. motion. Yeah. Oh well, that, that's the whole session. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, and I tried to get a movie of Dick Castilian doing that because I have wonderful movies of it, but it wouldn't come to So what this means is that most chemotaxis is not being mediated by the thing that cells are being attracted to. You have a process. And there is an emergence process which moves the cells towards the thing that they're being attracted to, but they're not being attracted by what it seems like. It says oscillations and feedback are everywhere, and it says information is completely different. Oh, what's the same producing that affected to that? When it receives a stimulus, it secretes some. Two things make it secrete some. One is meeting the yeast. And the other is meeting a stimulus that has been made by the cell in front. So the mediator is called lipotrine B4 or B4. And the stimulus that's coming off the yeast and the lipotrine B4 converge onto the same G protein very, very early on in the signaling. Pathway. So the cell can't really tell the difference between the yeast and the secreted signal. It all amounts to the same thing, the cell. Um, but the LTB4 is diffusible and short lived and um, and and something related. Um, go on. Well, I have a question. Um, so, in your model, the self generated gradient model, um, if they are traveling in narrow uh, channels, then there are only a few who will find the That's so, right. So, there's most of them left behind. So, how is that? Problem solved in, in, for example, in the press cell language, because also there you expect that a lot of cells will be left behind. Yes, great. Yes. But in a sense, I've um, I've answered this with what I just showed before, and actually in the maze before, which is you only need one cell to get to the front if the cell at the front is making a secondary signal that attracts other ones. Okay, that's that. And is this happening in the press cell? Absolutely. Well, in the press, I don't know. Um, in dendritic cells, for example, that's what's happening. And we only know it at a mathematical and phenomenological level. I have someone working right now about what the, what the, what the molecules might be that the dendritic cells are using. Um, so the same bit of analytical math that came up with the Staffan equation comes up with a really interesting result, which is the way that if, if you have enough cells, then the wave of cells is always exactly enough. And the point is that if you have slightly too few cells, then attractant escapes through the wave, so you attract more cells. If you have too many cells, then the one at the back receives zero information, so it gets left behind by the wave. Um, so you always get exactly the right number of the cells to deal with the flux of attractant coming in. Then it becomes complicated, and then you have to yeah. consult uh, Keller Siegel. Um, and there's, uh, I mean, there's uh, 10 or 20 papers every month on this issue. Um, what you get is you get these lovely waves of traction coming out. The cells have to be refractory for some period after they've seen it. And the exact emergent response you see depends on the, 
that's something different, but that's more the green and like an exciting sort of system. Same thing. Right? But I'm not in the self generated gradient in the system. So, in the self generated, in, in the simpler self generated gradient, you just have this interface, and everyone behind is left behind, and they'll never get it. But what seems to be happening in most of biology is that if you want cells to be left behind, then that's fine. That's what happens. So in, in your pigment, you do actually get a wave of melanoblasts that's constantly leaving melanoblasts behind. That's why you, your, your whole body is pigmented. And if you want all the cells to go, um, then you, to make it more robust, you must have a thing where some of the cells are leader cells and the leader cells have a secondary attractant. And, um, and it turns into just, um, turns into the sort of thing that we're very good at in biology, which is that the, the principle gets sorted out early on, and then the parameters can get tweaked in, in evolution. Um, and what you find, for example, in nerve pathfinding, um, is that cells that don't manage to connect just die. They go into apoptosis and they commit suicide. Um, but a cell generated gradient results in lots less apoptosis than you would have to have if they just moved, uh, you know, up, up and imposed. Yeah. Terrible thing about all of this is I've gone on about the interesting self-generated things and I haven't answered my ending thing. So I will show you <clears throat> one slide at the end. So imagine that a cell is responding to two different things, two different agonists who are the same receptor. So there are cells responding to an inefficient agonist. And this graph is showing the proportion of its receptors that get occupied, but it's an inefficient agonist. So if the receptor is occupied, there's a 20% chance it will get activated. So the gradient of Activated receptors looks like that. This is fine. It's a chemo attraction. So the, as the gradient goes up this way, the gradient of occupied receptors goes up this way, so the cells come up again. If you have a good attractant, then every time it binds to one of its receptors, the receptor will become active and the signal will get through. So a gradient that looks like this results in the gradient of um, so again with the gradient of a strong attractant um, the cell moves up this way but if you mix the gradient of the weak and the strong attractants then the occupancy of the receptors looks like this the occupancy is still getting higher and higher as you go from left to right um, but these are the receptors that are occupied by the strong agonist and these by the inefficient agonist. And then if you look at the fraction of the inefficient, uh, uh, of the receptors occupied by the inefficient agonist that are turned on, looks like this. So you have two gradients, both of which would send you this way. Uh, but because they are competing at the level of the receptor, and because they have different efficiencies, uh, the cells go this way. Um, and if time had permitted, I would have talked about this in a far more um, uh, uh, detailed way. Um, but since all the papers have come out about the self generated gradients, I've told you that. If you're interested in all of this, we published it this year. Um, and uh, I will be very happy in the next week to talk to anyone about it because it's, it's very cool. So, this would be a mechanism to slow down the spreading? Of yeah, or to uh, ramify it and make it complicated like you need when you make so if you think about um uh your immune cells um when your immune cells are responding to anything um there are dozens of attractants involved the the principal attractants are called chemokines um and typically if you you know if you cut yourself there's something like 10 different chemokines released um all in gradients and all of the cells are responding to all 10 of them. And probably what's going on here explains why you don't just get all the cells going in and nothing else. You have a complicated test. Actually, what we think this explains is why when you first get an immune response, 
the cells sweep in, sort out the infection or the damage or so forth, and then they slowly sweep back out into the blood vessels. We think that they probably have an efficient attractant to pull them in, and they use an enzyme to convert that into an inefficient attractant. So they start off going in, and then over time they come back. Um, the point in showing you this um, is just to show you again that um, uh, mass is the key of understanding what's going on in cell mm -hmm. movement. And uh, just you know, this is not a complicated um, uh, uh, simulation, but it's a complicated output. And that's what was going on here. That's the reality that was shown in the graphs uh, before. That's the strong agonist, and that's the inefficient agonist. And that is real time with them going the other way. And that is tracking the cells responding to the strong agonist. And that is tracking the cells responding to the weak agonist. And that is tracking what happens to the two of them together. Study. Thank you. That's about all I'm going to say, I think. So weak chemo attractants are attractants on their own, but they become repellents. And the general conclusions, you all know this. Complexity is your friend. Cells and attractants interact, yielding more information than you had before, which is wonderful. And the results are non trivial. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>